eminently qualified for her position as assistant superintendent, having earned her master's degree in educational administration and her doctorate in educational psychology from Temple. Dr. Wills. And good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here with you um, this morning. Dr. Holmes is uh, not available to be with you all this morning, so I bring you greetings from uh, Dr. Eric Holmes, our superintendent. Um, and also, uh, we're glad to have uh, Dave Meckley here. He is actually going to be going through the PowerPoint for the recovery plan, but before I turn the microphone over to him, uh, I do just want to say again, welcome. Uh, we're glad that you all uh, selected the School District of the City of York for your meeting today. Um, as we look to the recovery plan before Dave um, starts the presentation, I just want to say that this plan was truly a collaborative effort between our administration, teachers, uh, we certainly had parents involved, uh, and we do want to just say thank you to, for all of the community support that we've received. But this was a true collaboration um, of efforts, and we're very pleased to have Dave with us. Uh, we're pleased that he is um, still part of the team, even though some days he, you know, he'll say, well, no, this is your show. But we do still rely very heavily on him for his expertise, and we are very grateful for um, having him with us. Um, and finally, we are executing the plan every day. In the schools, with the administrators, we have our families on board. We are definitely focused on implementing the recovery plan because we do believe that it is the best thing for our students, and we also believe that it's the best thing for the financial recovery of our district. So um, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dave Megley. But again, thank you and uh, welcome. Been done any better. I've been telling Tamara all week she's making the presentation today. <laughs> uh, I also say it pays to uh, come late. Uh, all of you are over here. I've, I've had the pleasure of sitting with Karen, but we have a full plate of cookies that's the same size as all of you. That's just for the two of us. So that was very fortuitous. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, uh, today to give you an update, and we're going to kind of uh, walk through where we are and open it up for uh, questions. I wanted to start with some of the key issues that are driving the recovery plan. Uh, and uh, uh, number of one, any of you who have worked in a school district, I suppose whether it's in uh, Maryland or Alaska or Pennsylvania, uh, uh, legislative constraints and financial issues are, are uh, obviously the two key drivers and, and, and really uh, some formidable uh, obstacles. Uh, we need to do something that has immediate change, but has long-term improvement as well. Uh, a balanced scorecard, which we're going to talk about, and a broad uh, support, uh, supporting governance system. Uh, and I can uh, simply say that there has been more, there have been more articles in the newspaper over the years about the state, state of the New York City School Board, some ex-school board members uh, aside, uh, that when we say broad supportive governance system, it really is the broad governance, including the school board, uh, to make sure that over time there's a consistent and focused approach. <clears throat> this slide is an important slide because of the four districts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that are under financial distress. Uh, we're really the only ones, uh, the only district who said uh, we're not going to solve this by cost reduction. And the specific issue, which I talked about uh, at the meeting in March, is over the past uh, seven years, uh, we've lost roughly 33% of the eligible uh, students that are eligible to go to the school district in the city of New York, and they are now outside the system. And uh, so when you say, well, how are we going to fix the financial system uh, situation, that's Act 141, financial distress, uh, it really gets back to we've got to attract those students to attract those students, you've got to get at the core of why did they leave and why are they going to come back, and that's how we get into a safe, healthy learning environment and a sound, effective education. So at the core of all of this is, are, are these three principles that say, if we're going to move forward, if we're going to have a successful district, it can't be financially successful without a sound, effective education and 
safe and healthy learning environment. We did form an advisory committee. Genevieve Bray uh, is here, and uh, she participated uh, very actively, and I'm very <coughs> grateful for her support. Uh, the advisory committee uh, was formed in January, and uh, when I made the presentation to you in the spring, we were uh, underway and really dealing with these kind of two options that emerged. The one option was the 100% charter, which was introduced uh, by the New York County Community Foundation, uh, to whom I'm extremely grateful for not only uh, the idea itself, but uh, what I would consider very bold and innovative uh, stance as a community uh, agency to say, let's think broader and let's not pity pat around here. Uh, that created some very spirited, spirited discussion and I would say, as a personal opinion, had it not been for that presentation, I'm not sure that the internal uh, uh, option would have really emerged uh, as quickly or with as much uh, vigor. So <clears throat> we're looking at these two options, and, and, and in, in a lot of organizations, there's a defining moment, whether it's a political campaign. Uh, uh, there was a defining moment in this discussion of the advisory committee as to should we do the internal option or should we have these 100% charters. Uh, and of course the 100% charters, the idea is that there would be mandated performance measurements that were in, uh, built into the contract. Uh, and someone looked at the internal option folks, the union uh, teachers union president was there and said, well, would you accept the same standards and consequences that we're asking the external providers? And that was pretty much the defining moment in the process. Teacher, uh, union president said, yes. And so this hybrid option started to emerge uh, that really allowed the same kind of standards to be set uh, and, and really introduced consequences into the vocabulary of an internal plan. So the recovery plan is based absolutely on the collective, on the belief that the collective internal staff can and will transform the district. And the ideas and the, uh, the, the spirit, if you will, that came out of this process, uh, as, as Tamara says, it has been a very cooperative and a very energetic uh, uh, process. <clears throat> Input through a community education council. And this community education council we're going to talk more about, and, and I always choose my words carefully, but they are specific uh, decisions and responsibilities that the community education council has in this process that are really important to this educational process. Accountability and alignment with measurable performance standards. Uh, that's critical. And for those of you, whether you're in nonprofits or you're in for-profits or pretty much any other uh, place in the world today, uh, folks are accountable and there are standards and there are consequences. And I would argue that in the public school system in general, uh, not so much. Uh, support and remediation if necessary. Specific elements of the uh, building improvement plans are site-based management. Again, uh, it's not an all-new concept. Uh, again, organization, whether you're for-profit, not-for-profit, it's this whole idea of working together, uh, letting ideas generate from the bottom up, getting folks to stay in the game, it really lends itself to where we're trying to go. Academic program committee, community outreach, uh, school-wide behavior program, <coughs> And this cornerstone program uh, is a very uh, key part of, of what we're doing in terms of help, uh, helping improve the safety and discipline. But the thing I want to emphasize about the cornerstone uh, program uh, is that it was 100% internally generated. So in answer to the question of if we were really serious about fixing some of the issues that we have rather than hiding them, trying to manipulate statistics on discipline, how would we do that? And literally inside of 20 minutes, the administrative team said, well, we need to do XYZ, which was later named the Cornerstone Program. What the Cornerstone Program does in, in very brief detail uh, is it's a pull out for every grade, so that if you are a classroom teacher and you have a third grade student uh, who is misbehaving and really uh, conventional dialogue doesn't work, uh, rather than putting up with that uh, child and disrupting the rest of the class, uh, that child uh, goes to the Cornerstone program. It's a separate third grade program in a different building. We do a milk run, 
one with buses uh, to get that child really the support that he or she needs with the total goal of getting them back in the classroom as quickly as possible. Um, and so we have an alternative school, which is uh, more of a, a different kind of a pull out. But this cornerstone, uh, we hope, will be a very effective tool uh, so that we can get kids, uh, the disrupted kids, uh, out of the classroom and send a message to the remaining kids that there is a consequence for disrupting behavior. Uh, but again, the cornerstone of the program is work. We're going to refine it and make it better. That's a great example of this team really having the capability and the idea to do this. We need to release them, we need to get it coordinated, and we need to make it a policy for the district. So setting performance challenges uh, and standards. Pennsylvania School Performance, performance Profile uh, is going to be adopted in the Commonwealth. Uh, we have one that looks very similar to that. Uh, starting point is our current performance, reasonable progress. And, and you say, well, what's reasonable progress? Well, during the uh, advisory board committee uh, meetings, we learned about uh, a Renaissance school charter program in Philadelphia. It's not a perfect program, but it's the closest thing that we saw to something that might work at the school district in the city of New York. Uh, and I want to make sure that there is a clear understanding uh, of, of, among folks here that there's a broad range of the charter schools. There, uh, there are startups, such as York Academy. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum are what are called conversion charter schools. And conversion charter schools are, uh, I would argue, one of the most challenging because what happens from May to September is the same building is turned over to a different operation. And in the fall, uh, that group who is going to educate and manage that school takes all the students that geographic footprint. So they take the geographic footprint. So if a student applies that is disruptive or difficult, they can be turned away at some charter schools, not a conversion charter school. You go to the students in that district. So when you take a look at a conversion charter school and you say, well, gosh, uh, let's put 90% uh, free and reduced lunch. Uh, let's put 27% uh, special education. Let's put uh, English language learners at another, and oh, we have what, 180 homeless uh, kids in the district. So a conversion charter school is really a pretty daunting uh, task. But I would argue, and the data that we saw from the uh, Renaissance program, is they're pretty similar districts in terms of uh, buildings uh, of our demographics. So uh, Community Education Council is <coughs> excuse me, up and running. Uh, it is a group of school board members, as you can read down this list, a uh, pretty good makeup of the community. 50% uh, of the CEC are city residents. Um, so some of those are parents, but well, all of them, uh, all the parents are, are residents, obviously, and taxpayers. But some of the community leaders are, some of the uh, administration is. Uh, and uh, this community education council, different from the advisory committee, once formed, has authority is vested through the recovery plan and adopted by the board. So once this community education council, we're going to talk about what decisions and input this group has, they actually have authority, unlike the advisory committee, which was in fact advisory. So specifically, what does that community education council do? They are responsible for performance measurements. And how do we measure performance and performance goals and ratings? <laughs> They're responsible for improvement plans, school advisory councils, remediation and failure to approve, qualified selection provider, qualification and selection of external providers, I'll talk about that in a second, and external provider uh, performance. And so building by building, uh, as the, this uh, plan uh, continues, the recovery plan is implemented, each building will have standards that are going to be met similar to if we were 100% charter and we would have uh, external providers that were operating in the building, they too would have a performance contract uh, that says this, this, needs what's, this is what's needed to happen. So on the uh, blue end of the scheme, uh, if we really are successful, there's been a lot written about in the paper that teachers will be taking uh, cuts in pay and in the first year cuts. Uh, my goal, frankly, 
is the, the administration of the teacher the school district in the city of York making more money than any other district uh, in the county. Uh, and, and the reason that they do that is because they've earned it, they've attracted the students back to the district, uh, and the district has become financially viable, and they are sharing in a line with the rural district, uh, not as a punitive measure. On the other end of that spectrum, however, is the consequence if buildings do not improve and students are not attracted to the district, there will be decreases in pay and some buildings may be turned over to their external providers. So again, as we set standards and we looked at this Renaissance uh, data, this is a, a sampling of data, and there's approximately, uh, uh, I think around 15, 17 schools in the Renaissance program in Philadelphia. And some, uh, when we looked at this chart in the spring, uh, some were, uh, had been in operation for one year and some two years. So what you see here, the, the red and blue lines are the performance of these buildings before they were turned over to an external uh, provider. So this is, looks very similar to the school district in the city of York. One goes up a little, it goes down a little bit, but this is where we are. This was the performance when they were turned over to an external provider. So you see in the red, where there's only one year of operation, it went from 27 to 35, and with two years of operation in blue, it went from 30 to 46 to 59, and in fact ahead of the dotted line, uh, which is the uh, average for the state. So think about that. External provider, this is the combination of 17 schools in the school district and uh, one of the Renaissance programs in Philadelphia with similar difficulties. So when we take a look at standards and what is possible, we have to take that into consideration. This is a similar chart which shows incidents involving law enforcement, which is a little bit of a proxy for how self, how safe and healthy is our district. So the same thing, you can see there kind of up and down uh, incidents and you can see a dramatic reduction in this case and they were turned over to an external provider as well. So academics go up, safety and discipline improves as measured by uh, incidents going down. So when we wrestled with that uh, here in School District City of York, we said, well, uh, how is that going to look for us? Uh, and this is a little bit of a complicated chart, but you really can pretty clearly see, if you look uh, all the way over to the left, 12, 2012 to 13, these are all of our buildings they range, frankly, from under 20 to just under 50. And the average is that dark line in the middle that looks like it's right around 35. And so we said, where do we want to be in five years? And the principle of this chart was, well, we don't expect the same uh, uh, increase uh, from the 50 school as we do from the 18 school. But we want both to go up. So the idea is here, if you're starting from a higher place, your rate of improvement doesn't need to be quite as great, if you're starting from a lower place, your rate of improvement needs to be greater. So building by building, uh, the Community Education Council approved these goals. So year by year, this is now the performance standard for achievement. This happens to be math and reading combined because the uh, CEC, Community Education Council, also said, uh, we don't want these combined because we want both reading and math to meet the standard. We just don't want one really well done and one not so much. So these standards have been adopted. So this is now in place for the school district in the city of York. On safety and discipline, uh, we're a little bit behind. <coughs> this is a very complicated area uh, because uh, certainly if you measure incidents, then anything that gets measured gets done. And what you're really forcing is then to say, well, we got to get rid of incidents get rid of incidents and so you start, don't, you start not dealing with issues. And really that's been the problem uh, in, in many districts and we experienced a little bit of that over the past few years. So what the Community Education Council decided is, uh, and what we learned in the uh, advisory board meetings is we, Paul Clebson, friend, is, is here today somewhere, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we learned that <coughs> perceptions are reality as far as safety and the perceptions of teachers and parents uh, are really critical. But where do these perceptions come from? Frankly, mostly they come from students. So 
So the Community Education Council has really concluded that our measure for a safe and healthy learning environment is an annual 100% survey to all students with regard to safety and discipline. And you can read down through here uh, rules and norms, uh, physical security, uh, all these kinds of things. And so this is the device by which uh, we intend to measure climate. What this encourages, frankly, is in the first couple of years, we want incidents to increase because if we're not dealing with incidents, how can we create that safe and healthy learning environment? Uh, so we haven't, this hasn't quite been finalized, and uh, it's going to take us a little bit of time uh, uh, to get this one started, but uh, I, I think the methodology is right on track. School advisory councils are being formed. Uh, school advisory councils uh, fit right in with site-based management. They increase the participation of community members uh, and parents. Uh, and we're positioning them if and when an outside provider, external provider would be required, school advisory councils would be uh, there to uh, help select that. Implementation and oversight. Uh, if nothing more, this process has really put more exclamation points on the fact that the administration can't do this alone, the school board can't do it alone. It really takes a community and all of these folks out here. And the Community and Schools program that uh, we're going to be hearing about later is a great way, an important way, to positively impact uh, education and, and make this work from a community standpoint. Uh, there is some uh, a very uh, strong and uh, harsh uh, consequences for not bringing students back to the school district of the city of York. These uh, in, in decreases in salary in each of those late years, you can see, are pretty uh, substantial. These are maximums, and they are mitigated by either changes in funding uh, or students coming back to the district. Uh, in, in addition to that, uh, medical fringe concessions of about 50% of cost, uh, accelerated teacher evaluations in 13 and 14, so that if we have teachers that are not performing, we want to quickly remove them from the district and some additional teaching. There's an enrichment program as well, provision. And so if students do start coming back to the district, or if uh, a, a, a Democratic governor or Republican governor comes in and waves a magic wand and says, school district and city of York's going to get another $20 million, where does that money go? Well, uh, number one, we have a negative fund balance. And if any of you were in a business and you had a negative net worth, job one is, well, we've got to get out of our negative. Uh, number two, frankly, the student-teacher ratio here is wrong. We do not have enough teachers to adequately teach our students. And so uh, that's a piece of our problem. The third is support costs. Uh, Tamara doesn't really have what she needs to get materials uh, to the students. And lastly, we have employee compensation that is now being decreased. So again, this, this is not Dave Beckley. This came from, uh, again, the internal staff when I said, okay, if we're gonna have sharing, what's it need to look like? And I said, well, we need to go into these four categories. And guess what? When we've solved our negative fund balance, we don't need to put any more fund balance. When we've got the student-teacher ratio to where it is, then we can hold the number of teachers. When we get the instructional cost where it needs to be, we can stop there, and at that point in time, whatever that number is, 80, 90% will go to a back in compensation. So year one, we got an extra $10 million. 25% uh, would go to uh, establishing the fund balance, and 40% would go to teachers. If all of that is taken care of, uh, then the majority of it would go to teachers. So this is a, a very forward-looking uh, concept, which really, uh, again, shares this risk and reward. Timeline. Uh, the performance measurements uh, have been adopted by the CEC and the school board. Uh, the advisory councils are being formed. We've drawn a line in the sand of October 15th. The, uh, the teachers union voted in the spring to approve the recovery plan. Having said that, the union contract that runs out next June. And so we said, well, wait a minute, this is a five-year plan. Uh, we need a union contract that echoes the provisions of the recovery plan. And uh, so we are not uh, 
philosophically negotiating, what we are negotiating is interpreting the recovery plan, and we need to have that in place by October 15th. He said, well, that's next year. If we don't have it by June of next year, we're behind. Because if we don't have a union contract by June of next year, we need to be 100% chartered by September. And so uh, if by October 15th we do not have a signed contract, we will start to interview for qualified providers and put a plan together um, so that by next September we would be 100% chartered. So, in summary, recovery plan is based on the collective uh, belief that the internal staff can and will transform the district, provided by measurable performance standards, community input, remediation if necessary, and a system of accountability. Key issues, contract being signed by October 15th. Uh, if not, we need to take a look at uh, charter options will be pursued, list of qualified providers, uh, the migration trends ultimately uh, to current schools need to be reversed. The administration and the uh, school community did a wonderful job, you saw in the papers over the summer, kind of a, uh, a movement to get kids back to the district. Uh, it actually was very successful uh, in that for the first time in many years, uh, the, the migration actually should slow to near zero. So uh, uh, it, it was really a very successful campaign which gets us ahead financially for the first year of the recovery plan. And district standards and consequences can be established for charter schools. So we have these other charter schools out there. Uh, again, York Academy aside, and they recently did uh, just get some test results. Uh, frankly, the uh, academic performance of the charter schools is not substantively different than the school district of St. York. Well, if we're going to have standards for uh, our buildings, what are the standards and consequences for these other charter schools? Uh, so that's an issue that we really have to wrestle with as a community. Uh, and again, we have state law and we have contracts to deal with. Certainly, the spirit of it is these are our kids, we want the same standards. And the last thing uh, I would say before we, uh, we open it up uh, this is a, I'm, I'm an engineer by trade, a businessman, and, and I think I've gone through this in a very objective and, and concise way. There are social justice issues uh, here, ladies and gentlemen, that are extraordinary. If you, uh, if you want to raise money for this community and schools uh, program, Take a group of students into our school district with Dr. Willis and, and see the extraordinary things that happen in a very difficult environment and the tragedy that happens. It's breathtaking. So you say, how are we doing? Well, it hasn't been perfect, but we've made progress. And I will tell you, I can't imagine anything more that is worth doing not only as a community, but really you know, the lives and the stories that are embodied in these kids. Questions? Good. Mr. McLean, thank you, Dr. Wills. Um, I'd like to introduce, well, you know, I don't need to introduce Jane Conover, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Jane Conover is going to introduce Jane Hess. Um, Jane is as you know, I think, uh, York County Community Foundation Vice President in charge of community investments, and she's also a Women's Giving Circle member. She's going to tell us about the Community Foundation's interest in the Communities and Schools program, and then Jane Hess will tell us more about the program in general and how we could use it in York. Thank you, Joanne. I'm really happy to be here today to be part of this discussion and I'm thrilled that the Women's Giving Circle is engaged in education because really the turnaround in the school district is going to take every one of us and many communities of order. So thank you for your interest in this. Since the uh, financial recovery plan was passed, uh, the board of the Community Foundation and our York Council Committee voted to endorse the financial recovery plan for the city of York. And we did that for three reasons. One is, is you've heard that there is a higher accountability standards for the district, and not only the district and the schools itself, but also for the teachers. There is a broader governance structure, which we support engaging more community members in the discussion and decisions that are made to the, by the school district. And third, there are consequences for lack of performance, including converting schools to charter schools. 
Those were all things that were important to us in the recommendations that we made to the district this spring, and you heard about them by Eric Menzer, who is here to talk with you in the spring. Also, one of our recommendations was to implement the communities and schools model in the District of York. So when the financial recovery plan was passed, we invited um, Dr. Holmes and Dave Meckley to tell us what it is we could do to support their efforts. And they unanimously said that the communities and schools models was an important element to the success of the turnaround of the district and for the students. So your council and the foundation is began working with the United Way and Bob Woods to start a work group. And our job as a work group is to do our due diligence to better understand the communities and schools, know how it works, and how it can work in, in York. Also to visit other sites that are implementing communities and schools so that we can learn firsthand and identify potential challenges and, and opportunities for York. So our goal is, by December of this year, to have a uh, plan for um, the implementation of communities and schools, and a case for support. Why is it important for York business community, uh, all kinds of philanthropists to donate and give to the communities and schools initiative? The foundation is very interested in communities and schools. We have a fund for your county, which we are looking to be a lead giver in the communities and schools initiative. So we'll, we'll be uh, coming back with that exact dollar figure. We're working on the budget with the communities and schools to figure out exactly how much it would take to support this model within each school within the district. The reason that we think this is really important is because while Dave and his team, Dr. Holmes and Tamara, are working very hard on the academics and, and in the school district, we know by studies that two-thirds to three-quarters of what students, how students perform have to do with things that happen outside of the classroom. They have to do with whether they have enough food to eat. They have to do whether their family is supportive of their um, doing their homework. It has to do with whether they have eyeglasses or not, or whether it's safe for them to walk to and from school. That's how communities and schools can help support those initiatives and take some of that burden off of the school district to, and the teachers and the principals to try and link kids with services that they need. So it's really my pleasure today to introduce to you the executive director of the Capital Region Affiliate of Communities and Schools. It's a national program, and this is the regional director. Her name is Jane Hess. She's been with Communities and Schools for two years, and prior to that, she worked in the education field in a number of different, more di a number of different hats. She has a bachelor's. She has a bachelor's of arts degree from the University of Pittsburgh, and has earned a teaching English as a foreign language certificate. So, Jane, thanks for being with us today. Give me a minute to uh, call up my and thank you ladies for the invitation to come and speak with you and tell you about communities and schools. And I'd like to thank the School District of York for this lovely lunch. Um, one of the things today I'm going to talk about is just the overview of communities and schools and how it might fit into, and I hope that it will fit into the York Public Schools Recovery Plan. So and we're also going to talk about our model and how it's been proven, and it is evidence-based. So the mission of communities and schools is to surround students with a community of support, empowering them to stay in school and achieve in life. Communities and Schools was founded as a dropout prevention organization, but it also helps to foster institutional change by making those, by keeping kids in school. We found that we affect other parts of their lives, not just them staying in school. All of the work that Communities and Schools does is based upon these five basics, which are a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a caring adult, a safe place to learn and grow, a healthy start and a healthy future, a marketable skill to use upon graduation, and a chance to give back to your peers in the community. It's just a brief history of Communities and Schools. In the 60s, a man named Bill Milliken was spending some time in Harlem, and he was really, he was really affected by the kids not finishing school, just hanging out on the streets. So himself and a friend really worked to get, um, they were called street academies going. What they did was they brought kids who had left school 
back into the fold and really re-engage them in their education. And this was in Harlem in the, in the 60s and 70s. In the middle 70s, when Jim, uh, President Carter was elected, he really took to those model, this model, and he helped raise and identify $2.1 million to create and um, incorporate communities and schools. At that time, it was called Cities and Schools, but since then, we've changed the name. Between then and now, between then and 1994, it started to grow nationally. In 1994, Communities and Schools of Pennsylvania was founded. The Pennsylvania Network developed and started impacting students in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Southwestern PA, the Laurel Highlands, which is the Johnstown area, and the Lehigh Valley. In 2010, the Communities and Schools of the Capital Region was launched. And since then, we've started serving students in Dauphin County, Cumberland County, and Adams County, and currently have expansion plans into York County and Lancaster County. Just a brief overview of the, of the organization. And now the model. I'm sorry about the blurriness of this slide, and it has to do with the size and the distance. But what it is is, Communities and schools places, we call it a site coordinator. It's a person who's in school. They surround those students. They do all of those things on the side. They help leverage those needs into the school. It frees up the teachers to teach. One of the things about this model is, is that we constantly do evaluations of the work in which we're doing, of the programs that we're leveraging into the school. Besides bringing in whole school programs, we also carry a caseload. That site coordinator would carry a caseload for approximately 10% of the most at-risk students in that school. There would be one-on-one -on -one attention. Depend, there would be either referrals to human services, academic counseling, um, mentors, helping their parents get some of the resources and community in the community that they would need. So the communities and school model has been evidence-based. In 2010, the ICF International Evaluation Results, we did three randomized control trials and one quasi-experimental study. And that showed that the communities and schools model was the most effective program for decreasing dropout rates increasing on-time graduation, showed academic improvement, and decreased behavior incidences. And all of these results fit perfectly into the, the recovery plan. The organizations that recognize this study is the Stanford Social Innovation Review, and they put it on their What Works model, What Works list. ESMI, they performed an independent study that shows that communities and schools has a return of investment of 11.6 to 1, which means for every $1 invested in communities and schools, that community sees $11.60 return. And the Atlantic Philanthropies have also named it the most effective dropout organ prevention organization in the country. This is kind of a heavy, a heavy um, infographic. But what this infographic shows is nationally what the um, indicators for academic, academic achievement are. And these indicators in the blue, which is K through 12, communities and schools model has been shown to effectively make improvements where we should, schools that we're taking, we're, in, we're in, involved in, and that the communities and schools model is, is put into that school at a high degree of fidelity. We see fourth grade reading, and the fourth graders are meeting their common core standards. That their transitions are at an easier rate, which 
in the education community, transitioning from elementary school to middle school, middle school to high school, is where a lot of our students really start to get in trouble. And then in the high school level, they see a higher level of promotion, graduation, and fewer, and fewer behavior incidences. Some of the services that communities and schools provide are we provide a school needs, school-based needs assessment. We take data, PACE data, academic data, community data, government data, and really look and see what that school needs. Together with community stakeholders, the administration, and, and the person that's in place in that school, we do a gaps analysis, a thorough gaps analysis, and write up a plan write up an operations plan so that the site coordinator, that person that's in the school, is really getting a feel for that school that's going to help affect change in that school for the students and the community, develops an operations plan. And that's how we'll designate services, which community partners we'll bring in, and we'll definitely participate on community level boards and prevention coalitions. That's part of our model, to be integrated into the school and the community so we know what they need and we can be a trusted conduit of change for the students. This is an example of some programs that communities and schools has brought into the schools in which they've been ingrained in, in the state of Pennsylvania. Sparks programs or any sort of recreational program for students youth volunteer programs, freedom schools, technology programs, entrepreneurial programs, life skills training, family centers, diplomas now, financial literacy, and, and the list goes on. This is stuff that we don't necessarily, we can't afford to bring in, but we can help leverage resources, find the grant funding, talk with the implementers of that program. One of the things that's really great about having communities and schools site coordinator in the school during the day, managing some of those most at-risk students during the day, and helping to know what's happening after school, know what programs are going on in the community and in the school, there's a single point of contact. You know, the spark, that SPARC coordinator, they're going to come into school, say, maybe at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and not have the best feel, but there's going to be a point of contact in there that can help drive the right students to that program, help the coordinator of that program make sure that there's funding so that it continues, and even encourage the students that are head to the basketball court to make sure to, that are up to no good to get to some place that's a healthy healthy and safe place for them to be. And the other side is a list of, not as a broad, but smaller, it addresses a smaller, more direct population. In the state of Pennsylvania, last year, communities and schools served 20, 24 to 27,000 students. These are the most at-risk students in the Commonwealth. They were served with evidence-based programs, parenting programs, academic supports, case management, referrals, food and basic needs. It's amazing that so many students in this Commonwealth, in the city of York, in Harrisburg, they don't have the basic needs. And the school districts, as well-meaning as they are, they don't have the capacity because they don't have the resources to provide all these wraparound services so that all of their students receive the basic needs. Here's some more results. Of the students who were carried on our caseload, that's that most at-risk students, the students that the site coordinator has a one-on-one -on -one relationship with during the day that we check in, that we would check in with. 97% of those students stayed in school. 84% were promoted to the next grade level. 88 of the seniors on our caseload graduated on time. 73% improved academic performance. 
87% reduced at-risk behavior. Now, a statistic like that, that's a self-report from some kids that are engaged, that were previously engaged in high-risk behavior. So it has to be taken with a grain of salt, but the fact that they're reporting that to somebody shows that somebody cares about them, and that's one of the first big steps for some of these at-risk students to start getting on the right track. 71% improved attendance and 81% improved attitude. Again, another subjective statistic, but it shows that there, you know, some of that stuff is being reported by teachers, that it's not just, and even if some of those kids have a little bit of an improvement for a small period of day, it might start to expand and grow. The capital region's impact. We're a national organization with a statewide network, and then we have the Capital Region Affiliate, which is here in this South Central Pennsylvania, Dolphin County, Cumberland County, Lancaster, York, um, Adams, and Perry County is where this affiliate serves, the students in this area. Last year we had $167 per pupil cost based upon our budget. We served over 5,000 students, and they took part in communities and schools leveraged activities and service. 435 of those students received intensive one-on-one -on -one attention. So based upon our budget and that return on investment study that was done, we returned $3,596 of value back to the community. That's not always economic development, but some of that is increased taxes, some of that is lowered costs in human services, is where some of that calculation came from. This slide talks about risk and protective factors. The PAYS data, the Pennsylvania Youth Survey, is something that takes the the student's view of what their world is like so that, they, that they can get a, so that we can get a good view of how they view it so we can maybe start to affect change that they want to see. Students in this area report that there's a high level of community disorganization and a lot of transitions and mobility. When students report these things, they tend to have a higher degree of substance abuse, delinquency, school dropout, and violence. And these are all the things that we're looking to change. Part of it is being aware what the PAYS data does is helps us as adults, community members, stakeholders, be aware of what's out there so that we know what to change. What communities and schools of the capital region hopes to do, and hopes to be a part of doing here in the York region, is reinvigorating the communities and schools model. That model that surrounds those students with the community of support, not just from a communities and schools site coordinator, but the whole community. Because we found that that is the most, that's the essential way of creating institutional change, if everybody buys in. Use of early warning indicators. This has been in the news a little bit. Some First Lady Corbett is starting to implement some, the use of some early warning indicators across a couple um, school districts in the Commonwealth now. But these are important use of early warning indicators so that we know which students are most at risk. York isn't part of the pilot, but we know that truancy, absenteeism, um, behavior, we know what they are. We can work with school administration to make sure that the appropriate students are targeted for one-on-one -on -one help. Partner with school personnel to serve the most at-risk student. And this is one of the engaged stakeholders for collaborative decision-making. That is the way that communities and schools model is most effective. Not if it works in a vacuum, not if the site coordinator and Dr. Willis are standing there making decisions, but making sure that everybody's involved. Part of that decision-making process is use of data. Communities and schools track all of their data. We have a, it's a secure database, so we know how many students, 
what services they're receiving. We track their academic performance. We track their, their um, all of the indicators in which they were came to us for. So that we know if we're doing what's most effective and best helping the school. If something's not working, we look at it and we change our course. There's high expectations. Reduce chronic absenteeism. If the kids aren't in school, they're not going to learn and they're not going to do well and have, ex have elevated academic performance. Support grade level reading campaigns. Engage middle grade youth in their own education paths. Make sure that kids feel ownership, that they feel attached to their school. That's part of how we're going to bring some of these children back into the York, into the city school if the, the kids feel safe. If the parents believe that them and their children are, they have ownership of their educational futures, they're going to want to come to a school like this. I'm not saying that communities and schools is the sole conduit of change like that, but we can be an important part of fostering that and helping to free up the place the people that are in school already, the teachers, the counselors, the administration, to help continue to build that good feeling in the community. Another thing is to expand career and college options. Kids might stay in school, but if they don't have the ability to leverage what they've learned in school into careers, it, it still it doesn't give the community any value in them having a high school degree. Or, and then bridge school transitions, which we said is really important. Accountability and support, early warning indicators, appropriate support to keep on and off track students, use of evidence-based strategies, data-driven decision making, increased supports, extra learning opportunities in and out of school, and again, the most important part is to measure what you're doing so that the community, the funders, that they know it's being effective. And this is part of where I really see communities and schools fitting into the recovery plan. Thoughtful collaboration. Learn from other success, whether it's in a different community, from a different state. Create multi-sector partnerships. Continuously engage parents and families in their child's education. Elicit perspectives from the students, the educators, and the parents. As somebody who, I might be standing up here and decide this, as I said before, this is right, this is what we're going to do, but it might not be working for the people who need that service, for the parents and students, so it's really important to engage them, which communities and schools models insist upon. And message, you have to message. It's, 2013, we need to market it. Let people know we're out there. Make sure they see that the good that they're doing. Make sure that the students can become a part of that messaging too, which is an important part for the success of the school and the feel of the community. And this just kind of breaks down the sectors, which we know the youth, families, educators, juvenile justice. And my card is in the um, green folders. That is some of our marketing materials with some of our results that we've seen here in the capital region and statewide. I know that there's gonna be a Q&A session as soon as I put the microphone down, but if you have any other questions that you would like to reach out to me later, my telephone, my card's in there, please feel free to give me a call at my office or to um, send me an email. I'd like to thank you very much for your time and it was it was really an honor. Thank you.